Hello, good morning everyone. Just before we start with the event, uh, we wanted to give you a few important points to note about how this um, event will, will take place. The first important note is that the event is recorded and the recording will be shared. You will have noticed already that you are muted, so uh, you can ask questions via the questions box in your toolbar. When you do that, please write down your organization and question in one go and note that your name is on the record. So we will read your name out loud. If you don't want this to happen, just mention it in the question. You will be invited to answer several polls throughout the, um, the event. You will see them popping up um, and you just need to, to put your, question, uh, your answer there. Um, you will also notice a handout section in the toolbar. There we have the speaker's bio, so you can download it and read it uh, whenever you want to. And if you have any technical issues, you cannot hear us, you cannot see us, you cannot answer the poll, just write that via the question box or write down this phone number so you can call in case there's uh, something that doesn't work. Uh, we will start in a few moments with our host, Malte Lohan. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A uh, very warm welcome to you all. I'm your host and moderator for today. Uh, my name is Malte Lohan. I'm Director General of Orgalim. Thank you for joining us for our online event today uh, on globalization, ecosystems, and the EU's industrial strategy after COVID-19. Uh, I'm really happy to see the level of interest uh, in the topic uh, with um, fantastic uh, turnout in our event today and for everyone working in European industry, uh, for anyone working with European industry, we all know this is a critical time. As Europe charts its way out of the crisis, the competitive environment for European industry is being permanently reset. I'm excited about the discussion we're going to have over the next uh, 87 minutes or so. Uh, after some introductory words from me, our panelists will each take five to ten minutes to share their perspective, uh, and we then have some time for our discussion. You're welcome to send your questions throughout our event. Uh, please note that I will keep most questions until the end for our discussion. Many of you are familiar with Orgalim. Um, we are the organization representing Europe's technology industries at a European level, covering three main industrial sectors, machinery and mechanical engineering, metal technology and electrical engineering, electronics and ICT. And to give you a sense of the products, this ranges from the industrial robots used in advanced manufacturing to the sensors and the drives technology used for autonomous and electric mobility, from the equipment used for 5G, to the components required for smarter energy systems. Together, we represent around a third of European industry and around a third of Europe exports, with more than 11 million direct employees in highly skilled future-facing jobs. And some of the companies, of course, are household names from Siemens to Bosch, from ABB to Schneider Electric, but the vast majority of the 770,000 companies in our industries are mid-caps, SMEs, and micro-businesses. Our industry is at the heart of the transformation to a digital, climate-neutral, more resilient European economy. And they will be critical to a rapid, sustainable recovery from the COVID-19 crisis. We can go to the next slide. Like the rest of the world, uh, COVID hit European industry out of nowhere. Uh, and beyond the immediate social and economic costs, the crisis is accelerating a transition to a new phase of globalization. And Europe has a special stake in this debate. We are the only major economic bloc where exports as a share of GDP have increased since the financial crisis of 2008. What does that mean? If globalization goes backwards, we stand to lose disproportionately. So it's no surprise that a discussion has exploded 
over the future resilience of Europe's industrial ecosystems and the perceived need for more independence. And talk of global decoupling, of reshoring parts of our industrial supply chains here in Europe is becoming mainstream. Today we want to debate the approach to industrial policy in this new era, looking at the strategic questions we are facing. How is the crisis changing the global competitive landscape for European industry? What policy measures can ensure European industry continues to thrive in this new environment? And how can we reconcile greater strategic independence with the reality of our industry's global supply chains? These are some of the critical questions that we want to debate today. Now, before I introduce our panelists, I would like to run a quick poll. And we all know we are always measuring Europe against the world's two economic superpowers. So my question to get us started today is the following. Which economy stands to come out strongest from the crisis? There are, of course, plenty of other parts of the world, but let's focus on those three. And Georgiana, uh, please take us through the vote. Sure, the vote is now on screen and I see answers coming in. We will leave just a few seconds um, to allow everyone that wants to vote to vote. So please do it now. I will close the vote in five seconds. And the results are now on screen. Thank you, Georgiana. That's a, a surprisingly uh, clear picture emerging from uh, this vote now, uh, with uh, two thirds of you feeling that China stands to gain the most. Uh, good to see Europe um, in second place, although at a quarter, I think we have some room to catch up. Now, maybe keep this, um, this picture in mind because uh, we, We'll come back to that uh, at a later stage in our discussion this morning. Now let's go to our debate. Um, and if we can go to the next slide, I'm really pleased to introduce you to our panelists today. Uh, and I'm asking all our panelists to turn on their videos. In truth, uh, I think none of the panelists need any introduction. Uh, as I'm certain they are well known uh, to you all. But let me introduce them briefly, and I'll do that in alphabetical order. Um, we have, first of all, uh, MEP Maria da Grassa Cavallo from the EPP. Maria has a deep track record in innovation and research policy. Uh, she served as a minister in Portugal, uh, as a senior advisor in the Commission, and of course uh, was rapporteur in the Parliament on Horizon 2020. And Maria has been instrumental in creating the new Parliament Intergroup on Sustainable Long-Term Investments and European Competitive Industry. So a, a, a very important partner for our industries and she is now serving as the co-chair of this new Intergroup. Second, uh, MEP Martina Dlabajova uh, from Renew Europe. Martina is Renew Europe's coordinator on the EP Committee on Industry, Research and Energy, the ITRE Committee, uh, has a long-standing interest in SMEs, in social affairs and in technology. And uh, Martina, if I may add, you have extensive experience in the private sector yourself being a successful entrepreneur uh, uh, in, in another life or a parallel life to your uh, life as an MEP. Third, Kerstin Jona, Director General for the Internal Market Industry entrepreneurship and SMEs in the European Commission. Uh, Kerstin, of course, is well known to you all. Uh, she has a stellar track record in the Commission, including several head of cabinet positions, uh, senior posts in different DGs, and beyond her role as the top official for industry, uh, she brings to today's discussion also unrivaled expertise in funding and investment. Uh, she spearheaded the European Investment Plan uh, and she's representing the Commission on the board of the European Investment Bank. I'm delighted to introduce Rada Rodriguez, uh, our president. Uh, and unfortunately, Rada is joining us 
over the phone only. We have a, a technical glitch with the video, uh, but that should not distract us um, from the important contribution she will make today. Um, in her day job, uh, Radar is a senior vice president at Schneider Electric, a global leader in energy management and automation solutions. Uh, with a deep technical engineering background, uh, Radar held management positions running different parts of Schneider Electric's business. And I would add, she is a true product of Europe uh, with personal roots spanning east, west, north and south uh, of Europe. Last, but certainly not least, uh, Fabian Sulik, Chief Executive of the European Policy Centre uh, and also Chief Economist of the European Policy Centre uh, with a deep uh, background uh, in economics. Before joining uh, the EPC, he worked as an economic analyst in academia uh, in, in the public and private sector. A very warm welcome to all of our panelists and, uh, and a big thank you for joining us this morning. Now, let me turn first to Rada um, as the president of Orgalim uh, on, on behalf of Orgalim to get us started and dive into our discussion uh, with the Orgalim perspective. Rada, uh, you have the floor and I'm crossing my fingers that the voice connection is working. If you are talking, Rada, we cannot hear you yet. Okay, I think we are experiencing a more uh, disruptive technical glitch than um, uh, than I was expecting. Uh, let us change the sequence of speakers and rather hopefully we can uh, solve this and then we will start with Kerstin Jorna uh, on behalf of, Kerstin is not with us. Okay, uh, then we will do this in a different order now uh, than we had planned uh, and I hope those uh, other panelists that are with us uh, can uh, adjust to this new order. I would suggest that we then go to uh, to Maria Carvalho from the Parliament. Um, Maria, I see that you are connected uh, and we have tested your connection before. Um, so uh, I'm confident that this is going to work. Um, Maria, from the start of this legislature, you have been a champion of future-facing industrial strategy for Europe. Uh, this was already a hot topic, of course, when you started your mandate, uh, but it really became front page news with the crisis. So I'm excited to hear how you see the discussion evolving in the parliament. Uh, Maria, you have the floor. So good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the moderator, the colleagues of the panel. And let me beginning to saying that is an honor to be in this panel and uh, to take the opportunity to thank uh, Orgalim and the president, Rada Rodriguez, the, the director general or moderator, uh, for this kind of invitation. Uh, I will shortly uh, um, touch uh, three, three topics. The first is the, the, what I call uh, quoting uh, Vice President Vestager, open strategic autonomy uh, and explain a bit how, how I see this open strategic autonomy. Uh, I, I will then briefly address the role of innovation. For access code followed by the pound or hash sign. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes? we can. Okay. I had some uh, message, some voices there. Okay. Uh, so secondly, I will touch the importance of uh, uh, what I call a, a, a good triangle. That is the, the knowledge, the, the horizontal industrial approach and the investment as key for this autonomy. Uh, and finally, I will make a few remarks on the MFF and the recovery plan. So let's start with the importance of strategic uh, autonomy. Um, the COVID-19 outbreak, outbreak uh, brought our attention even more to the complexity of our global interrelation. Uh, and uh, it's true that uh, 
already before in the end of the previous uh, previous commission and in the beginning of the van der Leyen commission before COVID, uh, we were developing this concept of uh, European strategic autonomy, very much at the time based on the digital. Um, we now uh, have realized that we need to broaden this ambition to other areas, uh, to strategic areas, areas that are crucial to our well-being, uh, such as health, food, environment, raw materials, manufacturing, um, and uh, um, uh, based on the concept of value chains, uh, uh, we are analyzing uh, how these value chains uh, can be uh, to, have, to have strategic independence on, on these value chains. However, this should not mean that we are developing a new kind of protectionism. Uh, it's very important, and our uh, moderator has said in the beginning, um, one of our, uh, or probably uh, the, the main source of growth in Europe uh, has been the, the, the trade, uh, and we need to continue to be open to, to the world, and we, that is, um, a key concern that to, to make decisions to have some strategic independence in key areas, but keeping our chains, global chains, and continue to be an open economy to the world. That is very, very important. And I liked it, and I, I mentioned it again, uh, what uh, our Vice President uh, Vestager has told us in the INCO committee, uh, that for her, the concept, the, co the right concept is this idea of open strategic autonomy. It looks difficult to conciliate, but is is possible. So we need to conciliate the, the strategic autonomy with openness. Um, on the same topic, uh, Commissioner Breton and the Commission are working on the um, the implementation of the Renew Industrial Strategy based on the idea of ecosystems. Uh, and uh, here again, uh, I also uh, have the concern that is, it's important and we are welcome that we are looking at these 14, for the time being, 14 ecosystems. However, uh, we should not abandon what is crucial for the development of the economy that is the horizontal approach um, in terms of industrial policy. So we should avoid to have a very top-down uh, dirigist uh, uh, industrial policy. We have to continue uh, to the importance of developing um, the, the, the ecosystem for innovation, the right framework conditions for investment, uh, and to, to have uh, um, industrial policy of the 21st century and not uh, one of the last century. Uh, so uh, we need to be very careful uh, that the analysis of these sectorial um, uh, ecosystems uh, do not forget the main basis and the main basis is the horizontal policy, is to have favorable conditions for innovation with less bureaucracy, availability of investments without picking winners, uh, favorable macroeconomic conditions. So that is the basis to have a strategic autonomy and technological independence. And on the center of this is knowledge. If we invest in research, innovation, in education, together with a strong investment plan, this is the best way to have a strategic autonomy. The, the regions and the countries that have more effort investing on the knowledge triangle, creating the, the right framework conditions and investing are the ones that are better prepared for facing crisis and to be autonomy. And we should never forget uh, this point. 
Of course, this can be and should be complemented with analysis of the sectorial ecosystem, but the horizontal basis needs to be there, and is, this is the, the right way to develop an effective resilience uh, and a strategic autonomy that remains open to the world and enables global value chains to continue taking into attention to some strategic points that needs to be developed in Europe. So this is my uh, the way I see the strategic autonomy. To finalize, uh, I would like to have some uh, comments about the recovery uh, package uh, and uh, together with the new European budget, the MFF. Um, uh, and we recognize that the, is an ambitious package uh, and we will welcome this ambitious uh, uh, package. We are talking about uh, figures of uh, investment that uh, are high. This also uh, marks an important new approach in Europe because uh, even if we don't uh, call it, we are sharing the risks at European level uh, uh, and that shows solidarity uh, and we are very much welcome this pos position of the Commission, of the Parliament and I hope uh, of the Council. Uh, this is very important for all of Europe and, and mainly to the countries that have been more uh, affected by the, the, the crisis like my, my own. However, uh, there are some concerns, and very shortly I will uh, uh, point out what are the concerns. Um, it remains still unclear how the initiatives are getting together and some coherence and consistency between the different initiatives. For example, we see uh, uh, an imbalance uh, between the, the investment in the Green Deal and the digital. We very much welcome the, the, the uh, investments on the Green Deal, but we would like to see the same clarity in the digital, how we are going to finance cloud infrastructure, blockchain, 5G, in the industry 4.0 is still not clear. Second, uh, when it comes to the support to industry, uh, is it, also not uh, yet uh, clear how the member states will contribute to, um, to this uh, initiative. And we really need to have a coordinated approach with the, the, the member states. For example, when we are going to finance large projects like the uh, hydrogen, uh, um, we need to have a, a, a huge infrastructure that we have to contribute from the central programs like Horizon Europe, but the member states have also to contribute and to contribute a lot. Um, and uh, the member states have a lot of flexibility. So how all this is going to be coordinated we, is still not uh, very clear. So we need a methodology for this coordination between what is central and the member states. Another question that we are worried we don't see enough reference to the SMEs. We would like to have more emphasis to investment on SMEs, the question of access to finance, reduction of administrative burden, technical assistance, skills development. Uh, so more emphasis on F, uh, SMEs. And lastly, but not least, not least uh, for the ambitious numbers that we have on the table, we were expecting more investments on the what we call the new generation uh, policies such as horizon europe it has an increase of around 11 billion but we expected more also the erasmus also the creative europe also cef and um, so there are space so there are some areas that we were expecting that had more finance uh, than it is the proposal uh, that we have on the table so uh, we are convinced that uh, the initiatives will help a lot on short term, but to help for the competitiveness at long term, we need to do a lot of work still uh, on the proposal that we have on the table. So we have that to conclude. We have 
some good news, but a lot remains to be done together with the, the Parliament, the Commission and the Council uh, in order to clarify, to make it uh, um, more uh, coherent in that we really have a program that is not only for short, short term, but is really a program for the next generation in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria, for uh, these very clear remarks and um, and setting mm -hmm. the scene, I think, very well for a number of the points that we, I'm sure we will come back to in a moment. Um, now, I'm glad that we have resolved the, the two uh, technical glitches um, for Rada Rodriguez and for Kerstin Jona. So what I would like to do is to go back to um, the initial sequence um, that I had announced, uh, which means that we will now go to Rada Rodriguez as the president of Orgalim um, to share the perspective on behalf of our industries. Rada, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that, uh, I, I hope you can hear me and I'm happy that this is working now. Uh, thank you also from my side uh, to all the participants and especially uh, to our guest speakers for joining us today uh, as we want to discuss some very important topics uh, for us. Uh, let me please um, uh, make three, um, uh, three uh, observations uh, uh, in, 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 my, in my speech. Uh, one is on the economic impact uh, on our industry, so the corona uh, crisis impact on our industry. Then I would like to give you briefly some, uh, some lessons uh, we have learned from this uh, crisis uh, to, uh, to be careful for the future. And the third one, I want to go uh, uh, to have some observations on the uh, recovery package, especially the link to the industrial strategy, uh, just to uh, stimulate the discussion. So uh, on the economic, uh, on the impact of the corona crisis uh, on our industry, uh, we were not an exception uh, from, from this hit. And just looking to the figures, you can see uh, April and May, uh, our companies, uh, our industry was uh, around at, uh, working at around 60% of the normal activity, which is by far a much deeper drop than we had experienced uh, in, um, during the financial crisis 2008. Then you can see also uh, a major uh, issue on the uh, supply chain, 50 to 80% of the companies experience these issues and um, the biggest disruption was done in the intra-EU uh, trade, uh, notably because uh, the closure and the uh, uh, lockdown of Italy, Spain and France. Important topic as well, uh, implication on the employment. Uh, uh, we are expecting uh, around 5% uh, impact on our sector and this translated to our 11 uh, million people uh, which are employed in our industry, it will result, unfortunately, uh, um, on, into around a half a million uh, job uh, loss. On a more, more positive uh, note, uh, we expect uh, that we have hit the bottom uh, last month. However, when it comes to the, uh, um, to the pace of recovery and uh, the shape of the recovery, a lot will depend on the future funding and on the policy measures we put in place uh, in the coming uh, months. It is also important uh, for me to mention that our industries uh, were, uh, had a very um, healthy and uh, strong fundament before the crisis. So that's why it is important to put in place the right conditions because then we can return to be the strong uh, performance uh, industry which we were before uh, and to provide uh, the uh, growth engine for Europe. Um, this is why the recovery package, the next generation EU uh, embedded uh, with the long-term EU budget uh, are so important uh, for us. Please allow me to uh, tell you now, when uh, we are still on, on the in, in discussing crisis, uh, crisis uh, what are our lessons learned? What are our observations uh, from, from uh, this uh, uh, couple of months? Uh, we have seen already from the beginning uh, different responses uh, uh, to the crisis uh, across Europe. 
Uh, we are, of course, uh, aware um, uh, of the difficulties the governments uh, were facing uh, in this uh, very uh, difficult economic situation. And I would like to take the opportunity here to, to thank the European Commission and uh, in particular to Director General Yona uh, for the efforts uh, done to coordinate within the member states, but also to coordinate um, uh, with the industry. And uh, thank you for that. Uh, we have been in con uh, contact uh, with various services uh, across the Commission and uh, we appreciate uh, the openness uh, uh, to work with us. There are two observations I would like to do uh, linked to, uh, to this crisis. The first is on the single market, uh, which is the cornerstone of our economy. This is for the short term, but also for the long term, global competitiveness, very important for us. Um, this, if this was not clear before the crisis, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that this is very clear uh, now. As the member states uh, started to shut down uh, borders, uh, and uh, this was done in an uncoordinated matter, we have faced many obstacles uh, and we have faced many damages uh, for our industry and disruptions uh, uh, in the value chains. Therefore, uh, we are calling now for a standing single market rapid transfer uh, platform to be activated during severe cross-border crisis and which would serve as a connection point between the member states, the industry and the Commission. And we know that the Commission have already um, initiated uh, the uh, rapid alert function. We need now to put this uh, in place to go live and, and to make it work. Uh, the second point is uh, on the uh, divergent uh, national approaches when it comes to classifying some sectors of the industry as essential or systemic. Uh, we understand the intent, uh, we understand uh, the health and safety concern uh, which is behind this classification. Uh, however, it created uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, disruptions uh, and, and issues uh, for the industry because simply uh, some sectors which were classified as non-essential or non-strategic, non-systemic, were core suppliers for other sectors which were classified uh, as, as being uh, uh, essential. So uh, this cascading effect uh, were, uh, were leading that our companies were uh, struggling even more, even those which were uh, classified as essential had, uh, uh, were facing big, uh, big problems. So now as we look in the future and we want to strengthen our approach uh, to industrial resilience and competitiveness, we need to avoid a strategy that relies on assigning a specific sector or company or technology as strategic, essential versus others uh, which are not. Given the wide financial and competitive implications, the priority should be to create a framework for the best companies to succeed, whatever industry they are in. And here I would like to uh, emphasize that the advanced manufacturing uh, which our technologies, uh, which our industries, our companies are driving uh, is a key transversal driver also for the industrial resilience uh, in Europe and for the competitiveness uh, in the future. So that's why the advanced manufacturing uh, should be at the heart of the strategy. These were the two main uh, lessons. I'm sure there are much, uh, there are more, and, and I hope we will have time to discuss them la later on. Let me now return shortly on the uh, on the package and the link, especially the link to the industrial uh, strategy. So first of all, uh, Orgalim uh, strongly welcomes these proposals. Uh, apart from the content, we believe it is the right political signal because Euro, uh, Europe needs to be uh, uh, strong, to, uh, to show a strong solidarity if we want to emerge from this crisis um, more resilient, more green and more digital. So economy and society goes hand in hand and we cannot lose the public support for the European project, which would have very negative impact also on the single market and hence on our industry. We also believe uh, the recovery plan uh, provides the right financial firing power 
uh, without losing the track on the guiding policy, a focus on the green digital, on the green deal, digital transformation and single market. Please allow me to highlight three observations uh, linked uh, to the package uh, and again uh, uh, linked to uh, uh, the European Commission's March uh, industrial strategy because we see the package, the recovery package and the industrial strategy being two sides of the same coin. So first of all, and, and I'm very happy uh, uh, Maria Carvalho did also uh, mention it in, in, in her uh, opening, is that the recovery package needs to ensure a strong balance between the short-term liquidity issues and the medium long-term uh, uh, investment uh, in, Europe, uh, in Europe's future competitiveness. So collectively, we need to secure that the money goes to the future-oriented and to the transformational technologies uh, and companies. Uh, so that's why it is important to allocate ambitious uh, money to the R&D, uh, either to uh, Horizon Europe, but also to other instruments to support this long-term uh, competitiveness. Secondly, uh, I want to make uh, also um, a point on globalization, as it was introduced also by, uh, by Malte um, uh, in, this, uh, in this webinar. Um, many, because we don't believe that the globalization will, uh, will die. We don't believe that. Uh, we believe it is uh, evolving uh, into a new phase. Uh, many times it is called globalization 4.0 uh, because it has a truly a strong link to the industry 4.0, uh, which is now uh, uh, more and more uh, uh, the case uh, for, many, uh, for many companies. What the corona crisis revealed, however, is the risk and the danger of highly concentrated and just-in-time supply chains. So this, in my opinion, is accelerating the transformation of the supply chains for more resilience. And this is part of every company's daily uh, work to adapt their strategy to the reality of their market. So companies will continue to rely on global supply chains, even if looking to diversify them and to increase by that the resilience. Finally, just a couple of words on the concept of key technologies, ecosystems and value chains. We believe this is a good focus, it's a good approach, uh, but we need to ensure that these concepts came together with a strong industrial input. Uh, we are calling for a clear, transparent mechanism for the industry input as it was initially foreseen in the Commission's industrial strategy, which was uh, open on, on, uh, on, in, in March, uh, where the industrial forum uh, is mentioned. Unfortunately, we know we are not seeing this happening today uh, at, the, at the same time as uh, very important de decisions are being uh, taken and uh, uh, which are fundamental for, uh, for uh, our industries. That's why we, uh, we strongly uh, call for uh, putting this, uh, this, uh, this industrial forum in place and uh, make it work. Uh, we also believe that the advanced manufacturing uh, is a core strength for Europe and also here uh, thank you uh, Maria Carvalho for mentioning the horizontal approach. Um, the industries of the 21st uh, uh, century um, and uh, because uh, it is a, uh, because it is a transversal approach in, in our um, technology industries and uh, uh, in, in the advanced manufacturing, uh, we believe that this should reflect, uh, should be reflected in the in the strategy, including uh, being recognized as a specific uh, ecosystem. So um, I want to uh, stop here because we have still uh, uh, some very interesting guest speaker to uh, to give the floor to. Thank you so much, and I'm looking forward uh, uh, to the next uh, to the next uh, uh, keynote and to the discussion afterwards. Thank you. Radha, thank you very much. Uh, and um, uh, clearly, a central question which is facing industry and policymakers alike 
is around this concept of industrial resilience. And, um, uh, and one of the aspects of that conversation, of course, is around the potential benefits of reshoring industrial supply chains uh, here in Europe. Before we go to our next speaker, uh, I just want to uh, turn to our participants for our next poll. Um, this will be, again, a very short poll. Um, and the question is, does stronger resilience need to include reshoring of industrial supply chains? Georgiana, over to you for uh, helping us with the vote. Thank you. I hope you can all see the poll on the screen and you are able to vote. I see votes coming in, so it will allow for for you to vote for uh, for 10, 15 more seconds. Great, almost half of you have voted now. So let's allow for a bit more to see how this is shaping. Um, and in five seconds, I'll close the poll so it's the last chance to put your answer in. And closing it now. Okay, thank you, Georgiana. So this is a, a pretty clear um, picture emerging um, that uh, more than two thirds, so we're almost uh, almost 80 percent, uh, feel that reshoring industrial supply chains has to be part of the answer of stronger resilience. So uh, that is a, a more uh, clear picture than I had expected uh, that helps for our discussion and I think puts also the finger on some of them uh, the questions we we want to be asking today. Now having heard from uh, Rada uh, let's turn to our next panelist. Uh, I would like Kerstin Jorna now to um, uh, to take the floor. All eyes of course were on the commission last week as you presented the long-awaited recovery plan. And this is now the formal basis for member states, for parliament, for all of us um, to, um, uh, uh, to feed into a, a future foundation for European industrial resilience um, and competitiveness. Uh, so we're excited to hear your perspective on what the Commission has put forward. Uh, Kerstin, you have the floor. We don't hear you yet, but we have your video, so it's you a good can start. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Sorry for the glitches in the beginning. Um, on 27th February, I was still in my old job and I was attending uh, a roundtable with economists uh, organized by KFW and OMFIF in Frankfurt. And what I retained is very much a Last Supper ambiance because we were discussing for sure this would be a, a huge shock for Europe, uh, what we knew about the pandemic. I mean, the, the, the seminar was actually about uh, sustainable and green, but, uh, but the question then was, will it be a V, will it be a U-shaped return, or will it be an L-shaped return? And pretty much of what we discussed in that situation, which, by the way, was the last meeting that was organized at KFW because they, uh, uh, they, they closed um, uh, or, or meetings in, in in the building. Uh, what we discussed then pretty much was came true in the sense that there was a very sharp downturn, and we saw the what Oara told us before. Um, hospitals were uh, were at the limits of what they could do in some countries. Uh, people were staying at home. Factories closed. Shops closed. Uh, all social life closed uh, and uh, and so the first issue then was to stop the fall the free fall and uh, that was to help to give a lifeline I mean to help our hospitals obviously to operate and, and, and deal with the problems and also give a lifeline to our companies uh, which is in the form of liquidity support we acted very strongly and that was the kind of first uh, reply to stop you know the V going down. Uh, we opened the state aid uh, possibilities for member states to uh, support their companies. We uh, we have Shore, which helps uh, national systems to uh, 
keep people in their jobs um, for short-term work. Uh, there were something like uh, a third of our member states who had such systems when the crisis started. Now all of them have uh, such systems and that helped to stabilize uh, the unemployment numbers. Um, we also kind of emptied all the drawers that we still had in the current MFF uh, in particular uh, to put it together for the uh, emergency instrument uh, to help member states uh, and health systems to deal with the problems and we also had the CRI 1 and 2, the corona response instruments which uh, uh, allowed and accompanied member states in, uh, in using the, the current uh, still unspent structural funds money to actually help uh, solidify uh, the health systems. But that was not all, so that was the money. But uh, we also uh, needed to increase the supply for uh, equipment, protective equipment like masks, uh, for ventilators, for disinfectants. And we had a great cooperation with the industry um, and many of the companies actually volunteered to change their production lines and, and produce uh, uh, these things in Europe because we had a problem uh, shipping them in. It meant solving issues like standards. Uh, we, we opened 14 standards in cooperation with our standardization uh, bodies so that everybody could use them freely. They were freely accessible. We, uh, we, we solved issues around market um, conformity, market assessment, uh, and uh, to allow these uh, equipment to also uh, uh, be used anywhere in Europe. We had joint procurement exercises uh, for and total together with member states to make sure that we don't multiply the processes and the administrative hurdles, but that we do it together. Um, and yes, there was what uh, the phenomenon uh, that uh, Rada, you already mentioned, the, what I call national distancing. Uh, member states, uh, the gut reflex was to close the borders. And uh, we had very intense discussions uh, with all the member states, we reduced uh, the export restrictions in particular um, by, uh, I mean, to, to, to very, very few still remaining. But member states have understood actually that it serves no purpose uh, to stock material uh, where you don't need it. We introduced the green lanes. Uh, I understand the conundrum about the essential, um, the essential goods uh, and how it did not work with with the supply chains if you have a kind of uh, different interpretations and that's something i clearly see as the lessons learned um so but that was dealing with the crisis now we come to the second leg you know is it a v is it an u is it an l and um we pretty early on started to what was already referred to to look at the ecosystems now, the ecosystems, uh, we identified the 14, 14 ecosystems that range from health to, uh, to renewable energies, to tourism, um, to uh, automotive and mobility sector. And uh, we thought that policy to kind of make it a V to, for the economy to pick up rather than the U or the L needs to look at the needs first. So what's the needs assessment? For that, we had the identification of the ecosystems, um, which uh, allowed us to cover more or less 70% of the economy. We then looked at the health bulletin. You know, what happened in these last three months in, in, the, in these different ecosystems? Uh, where were the liquidity shortages uh, the most acute? How many, how, what did the supply chains, how did they work? Where did the integration, I mean, did these chains break down? And where are the uh, uh, the losses, the biggest losses? So we had that analysis. But then we looked at the third thing as well, which is the uh, the um, investment needs. And it was pretty clear for all of us, and the, in, the also the information that we got from talking to the different stakeholders, that the green and digital still remains very valid. So repair is one thing, uh, but you know be able to bounce forward in uh, in the recovery uh, to have to build a better and more resilient system uh, that is also important and this needs assessment which was a very intense work uh, which was also the first time i want to underline that that we looked at the macro angle 
which we always do, but we also look at the microeconomic angle and brought these things together. It was the first time that we um, that we did this work. And um, of course, you have to develop the methodology. It's something new, but we are deeply convinced that we need to look at these two things and to bring them together when we deploy the different financial instruments in the recovery package, but also beyond. And, uh, and Maria and Rara, you both said that, we also need to look at national spending. It all has to come together to make it a V, not the L. Now, based on this needs assessment, um, which we will continue to look at, and where the ecosystems is not a panacea, it's a way to look at things which we didn't look at before. And it's a way to look at things which opens the perspective to the single market and the working of the single market. We've now also geographically mapped to the ecosystems and it's clear, I mean, they cut across borders, they concern more than uh, one member state. So thinking about the recovery in terms of, you know, like 27 uh, recoveries in 27 countries will not work because we need to think in, 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 in the broader ecosystems. It makes no sense to open a shining car factory in one country uh, and have all the workers go back to work and then not be able to have the parts uh, that have to be used in that company to be for assembling because they come from other countries where the companies where workers still cannot go into the companies. We need to look at the whole chain. Um, now, in the recovery package, uh, I'd like to highlight three points. The first is that what we observe with the liquidity support that European uh, measures via the EIF, um, but also national measures uh, gave to companies, that's very heavy on the balance sheet. I mean, first of all, there are some who didn't, who couldn't benefit from these measures, uh, and I'm thinking in particular about the startups. Um, and this is because we worked through, uh, and member states also through a lot through intermediaries. Uh, and the second is um, it it makes your balance sheet heavy. So when you want to invest, you know, you want to engage in the V or the U, then the banks will not give you money because it's too heavy. So first thing, we need to repair balance sheets. And repairing the balance sheets means uh, is the solvency instrument that we proposed. Uh, to help companies uh, to solidify their capital base. Um, then also I want uh, to say a word about resilience versus, versus strategic autonomy. Um, and there is a debate, both concepts are used. Uh, uh, what we have, it's a new, it's a very new concept and we have to, uh, to think about uh, it also for the European level, at the European level the fifth window in InvestEU would be the place to think around that and from our point of view it's um, it's very much about being able to face another shock, another crisis, uh, uh, the recovery in a better way and um, we think it's very timely to, uh, to think on this. It's not about closing of Europe or being against globalization or reshoring everybody. It's actually into having a more diverse uh, system. Uh, and uh, the third uh, point I want to make, we spoke a lot about the EU budget and uh, what member states can do, but we also need to look at private investment. The recovery needs, and I mean, we've proposed a big package, but we need to pull in private investment. Invest EU, the guarantee, is a way to actually bridge between the non-bankable uh, projects, the beginning of them, which grant and subsidies, and then the two, the completely bankable ones where private sector can will come in and they will deal on their own. But uh, in between, we have the guarantee that takes part of the risk and allows to uh, the funding chain and the, the 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 innovation chain to continue. It's important that we keep in mind this um, this chain aspect. If I would like you as a takeaway to take one picture, I think it would be the picture of a steamed powered locomotive. Uh, I'm sorry uh, to have such a last century image, but it says the steam will be there. That's the money. But what we have to do for the locomotive, it has to pull different wagons. And these wagons will be the projects, the investment that we have in strategic sector, the renovation wave, 
for example, a package for the tourism sector to have more sustainable tourism, um, uh, uh, a more resilient pharmaceutical sector, let's say, uh, a, a car uh, and automotive sector that's ready uh, to engage in the uh, uh, in the future. So we need this project, and that's why we need industry to be part of it. The rails, if you want, is what Maria, you call the horizontal. It's the single market. It's standards that work for the future and that are uh, built by industry. It's the policy vision that gives certainty to investors uh, about our green and digital and resilience star, which will be the stars to follow. Thank you. Thank you, Kerstin. And I like the image of the of the steam locomotive as a, as a reminder that technology innovation breakthroughs don't have to be digital um, to to make a, a transformational difference um, to to our our society and our economies. Um, and I think it's clear from what you describe, and you know what, of course, we all saw uh, with the announcements that there is a lot of fresh thinking. Uh, going into this recovery plan, and, and I like the way you describe um, the uh, the role of the ecosystems to avoid the recovery plan breaking down into simply 27 recoveries, uh, and that resonates a lot, of course, um, with uh, with our industries. Um, now, there is a lot at stake uh, for for industry itself. I think there's also a lot at stake for the Commission um, in in finding the right policy prescription for an unprecedented situation. Um, I want to turn back to our audience uh, to get a first impression, kind of one week in, as it were, uh, of how our uh, participants today assess the proposals. And um, so let's bring up the uh, the next poll, please. Uh, very simple question. Will the recovery plan strengthen the global competitiveness of European manufacturing? Uh, Georgiana, I hand over to you to take us to the vote. Thank you. Yes, the, the vote is now launched and the answers are coming in fast. Um, please choose one, one option. This will be very interesting to see. And we have half of you that have now voted. So we'll give 10 more seconds and we'll close the vote. Okay. I will now close the vote and we will see the results on screen. Very good. Thank you, Georgiana. So as a as a first um, uh, for, first reality check, um, I think this is a pretty clear signal um, with a an overwhelming majority of those on the line and voting uh, agreeing that this is strengthening our competitiveness and I would certainly uh, subscribe to that as well. Uh, a not negligible minority has some doubts, let's say. Uh, this is of course by no means meant to be scientific, but um, you know we have, a, uh, we have 134 uh, participants uh, on our event today. And uh, of course, from the kind of immediate uh, group of stakeholders most concerned, so it, it, it certainly helps to um, uh, uh, to provide a, a first reality check there. Um, thank you again, uh, Kerstin, and of course we may come back to some of the points that you mentioned uh, in, in a moment. Now I want to turn to Martina Dlabajova uh, for a second perspective from the Parliament. Uh, Martina, my apologies for uh, splitting uh, the Parliament perspective into two. Uh, uh, that of course was not the intention um, and um, uh, I hope you uh, you don't mind that you come back now um, with a, a second voice from the Parliament. Uh, in your role as the ITRE coordinator for the Renew Europe Group, you are really sitting at the heart of this debate. I know you're speaking to uh, Commissioner Breton, for example, uh, later today. So uh, looking forward to your uh, contribution, Martina, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Malte, and thanks to all. Thanks for organizing this very interesting webinar because I think it's much needed. And uh, maybe it's good that we are a little bit spread with my colleague Maria de Carvalho because I can complement something. We are very complementary, we are working very much together, and it's very good to hear the perspective directly from the industry and from the European Commission. So I will try to sum up some points. Something will be repeated, but I am happy that I can complement 
everything what was said until now. So, of course, COVID-19 is said to have caused the, the greatest crisis after the Second World War in Europe. It had a massive impact both on European citizens and business. The economic crisis related to this pandemic won't be overcome by the work of single national economies, but through a strong joint economic response. I think that we all agree on this. I'm sitting here, as you said, as Renew Europe Group Coordinator in the Committee for Industry, Research and Energy. And I must say that during last month, the discussion on the COVID-19 response and industrial recovery was the priority number one. All sectors of our economy have been impacted by the crisis. Some of them have to com uh, come to a complete standstill. I am talking particularly about some traditional industries, and I have some figures from European Commission, and of course, industry might correct me, but I am talking especially about automotive sectors, which was particularly hit, which employs 11 million people uh, in, uh, in Europe, and which was nearly at a standstill. I'm talking about tourism, which employs people and nearly 3.5 million companies, actively fell back in the second quarter, and it will have serious consequences for a number of small family businesses and also for airlines. And uh, something not to forget are cultural and creative industries as well, which give jobs to 1.3 million people in Europe. Of course, the industrial actors all around Europe are describing the main difficulties which they have to face in this unprecedented situation. And both the European Parliament and the European Commission are reflecting it. We had many discussions about it with Commissioner Breton. We will have another one this afternoon. And he mentioned these three main points, and I must agree with him. First, there was the collapse of demand, which have created cash flow and liquidity problems. Second, Industrial value chains, which stopped their functioning due to health measures and also due to logistic bottlenecks. A third, a lack of workforce, especially in sectors relying on seasonal labor. And I would mention the fourth one, very uncertain prospects of improvement, because no one is able to predict when the crisis will be over and what will happen next. Before the crisis, we could already see that the EU lost traditional productions to relocalization and missed the early development of forefront technologies. This crisis has shown us, from my perspective, one very important thing. The European economy is extremely dependent on foreign imports of raw materials, affecting particularly strategic sectors, especially health, defense, digital and energy. We could see that EU is dealing with the crisis uh, in very, I would say, even if it does, didn't look like that, very efficient way. And I mentioned two different levels. First, EU is dealing with the crisis by accepting quick measures in the first weeks, which was the injection of liquidity by the ECB, relaxation of the rules of the stability pact, the opening up of the state aid, the increase of the EIB's capital for SMEs and the SURE initiative for Kurzarbeit for short time working. And at the second level, EU is dealing with the crisis by introducing the recovery plan, whose aim is to pull the EU out of the crisis. On one hand, this plan needs to have sufficient financial capacity to compensate the damage caused by the crisis to our industry. And on the other hand, it must be an opportunity for future investments and the creation of major European industrial projects. But of course, this is not enough. We need to look at the future and have an ambitious industrial strategy, ambitious long-term industrial strategy. I mean to have a vision that is future-proof in line with the two underlining goals, which are digitalization and sustainability, and which will bring together industry, research and innovation. As you know, the European Commission has, has already presented its vision of new industrial strategy and as well of the SME strategy. I see as very unlucky uh, that uh, it happened only two days before the start of the crisis. There was no media attention, uh, very limited industry attention, very limited SME's attention. But I hope that this is kind of second chance for all of us, for the European Commission, for the European Parliament and for stakeholders as well. We are now working on it in order to have a sharper, more incisive action, taking stock of the painful impact of these months, but looking with ambitions at the immediate and long-term future. 
we know all we need to react very quickly. A great deal of the work remains valid, of course, but we cannot just take the papers from 9 of March from the Commission simply because the situation, situation has changed. We need to think together how to do it in a different way in coordination with the recovery funds proposal. We need a new approach, and I can assure you that the ITRE committee in the European Parliament is already working on these topics. Uh, we are working on our ITRE own initiative report on an industrial uh, strategy together and in synergy with the own initiative report on a European SME strategy. This letter being under my own direct responsibility as I am the Renew Shadow Reporter. So what should we focus on? Uh, and I will come to the conclusion. Uh, I will mention five points, which for me are very important. First, we need to restore and further deepen the single market as a key component of prosperity and resilience. I strongly believe that the single market is the cornerstone of the recovery plan, especially if we can expect export markets in the rest of the world to be less accessible in the months and years ahead. It is more important that, uh, than ever that our internal market is functioning properly. Second, at the same moment, we need to maintain a level playing field, both in the single market as well as at the global level. The goal is to bring back to Europe strategic production and gain independence from foreign sources. We must increase the EU resilience by recovering production chains and uh, that were delocalized at the time due to their low added value and which must return to the EU. The third point I see as, as very crucial, uh, if we want to build resilient European industrial ecosystems, we need strong SMEs participation and we need carefully protect these companies from unfair practices due to the vertical integration in supply chains. Especially now, we need to give them a real second chance to survive the crisis. Uh, point four, more than ever, Europe must be very vigilant against the risk of takeovers and strategic foreign investments that could further increase our dependency. That is why the industrial plan must be accompanied by an adequate use of European tools for monitoring foreign investment and the strategic approach to trade. To trade. And my last point, last but not least, innovation is the key driver for economic recovery and growth. We have to ensure that Europe is well represented among the commercial giants who will emerge in the future. To achieve this goal, we need to work together and use our resources and research and innovation on an EU-wide scale. In ITRE committee, we are having regular meetings with the Innovation Research Commissioner Maria Gabriel, who has been doing an excellent job. I really must say I appreciate it when, at the beginning of the crisis, she immediately mobilized funds from Horizon Europe program for COVID-19. I also welcome she mobilized money very quickly for innovators, startups, SMEs and laboratories who are working on a vaccine. I have called uh, on the EU to invest more in research and development, in particular by strengthening its Horizon Europe program. It was already said by my, my colleague Maria Carvalho, but uh, we are of course still examining how the new proposal for the recovery plan and the new uh, MFF will interplay together. I appreciate very much the effort by the Commission, but it still falls behind the European Parliament ambitions. For example, the, the ambition of the European Parliament for Horizon Europe was 120 billion budget. For me, it was a disappointment to see a new proposal. And the same goes for Digital Europe and Creative Europe. What I see as important is to ensure public-private cooperation to promote the transfer of knowledge and technology from research centres to the industrial process and vice versa, take stock of market demands. We have seen the clear added value of public-private partnerships, and we are waiting to see how the Commission will further elaborate to address each selected industrial ecosystem. And I'm, uh, I will stop uh, here. Just let me do a very quick conclusion, so we have in mind some points I, I wanted to leave you with. So, as I said, first of all, the backbone of the European industrial recovery for me must be single market. Second, we should not focus only on saving existing jobs, but also on generating and creating new jobs, so looking to the future. Third, Europe should invest itself out of the crisis, meaning there should be measures which will enable and encourage investors and entrepreneurs. Fourth, 
recovery plan should avoid unnecessary costs and administrative burdens for companies. And fifth and last, we should think not only in short or medium term perspective, but systematically work on long term strategy, how to tackle the challenges which the EU will face in the future. So these are my main points I would like to leave you with. And I'm uh, very much looking forward for debate uh, because I think it's even interesting to see the results of the polls. Uh, I, I consider um, the public we have in this webinar uh, very close to uh, what, what we feel in ITRE committee. So for me, it's very interesting to see how we should address better all the challenges. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Martina. And, and um, maybe uh, two quick points uh, around the audience participation. One on the polls. Uh, we had a question on this. Uh, I think important for everyone. Maybe uh, the the level of participation in the polls is 70 to 80 percent. So it's about 100 people. Um, I also see uh, a lot of questions now coming in. Uh, you know, we, we see the the interventions are prompting some some reactions from the audience. I see them coming in here in my uh, in my questions box. We'll try to pick some of those up again uh, in a moment, um, being aware that we won't have time, you know, to answer all of them uh, individually. Um, We've talked a lot about some of these important themes around resilience, also around technological independence, and I want to turn to the audience again uh, for a, uh, another poll uh, around this subject specifically on technological independence. Do you think Europe needs to become technologically independent, and whatever that may mean to you? Uh, this is our, our question. Uh, Georgiana, uh, please take over for the poll. Thank you, Malte. We have already 30% of the participants voting, um, so I encourage you to, to do so. Um, we won't leave much more time, so please cast your votes now. And in five seconds, I will close the vote. Okay. Thank you, Georgiana. Again, uh, uh, a very similar picture to our previous poll around uh, question of supply chains. Uh, I, I think slightly bigger a level of disagreement we have here. Um, that's more than a third, at least, of, of you. Um, that have some reservations about this notion of technological independence. We certainly like to prefer uh, prefer to talk about technological leadership uh, as opposed to uh, to independence. Um, now, uh, let me turn to Fabian Zulek. Uh, and um, uh, Fabian, of course, EPC has been very engaged uh, in this debate uh, for a while. I know you also take a, a personal interest uh, in this, so really look forward to your um, final intervention on this. Now, the curse of being the last speaker uh, is that I'm going to ask you to be very disciplined on time. If there's a way that you can keep your comments to five minutes, I would be uh, immensely grateful uh, with my apologies. So, um, Fabian, uh, I don't see you yet on the camera, but I assume that you are still with us uh, you have the floor okay um, thank you very much um, thank you for inviting me and I will try to be very brief um, so I'll go straight into my presentation so if I could have uh, the slide please so um, what I wanted to say really um, and I will summarize it very much so I'm not going to go through everything on this slide um, but uh, the key thing for me is, um, first, we have to understand what kind of crisis we are facing. And uh, the COVID-19 crisis, in my view, is different uh, from what we have seen before. Uh, there is still a lot of uncertainty, um, but I think uh, the key takeaway for me is that uh, the real economic challenge is still to come. Uh, we've had a period of lockdown, we have had a period of enforced inactivity, uh, but the longer term uh, systemic crisis, the structural changes which will come through, 
will only start to appear um, once we start getting out of lockdown, once we start getting out of the health crisis aspect of this. And there will be some form of rebound um, as uh, different industries start working again. Um, but I think the question of where we are going in the longer term uh, remains uh, very valid. Uh, and I think we are facing uh, something which will certainly be a recession, um, potentially even a recession like we haven't seen uh, in a very long time. Um, what does that mean? Um, I think there are some key features uh, about that longer term which we need to take into account. Uh, one is uh, that the international environment is going to be very different, uh, that we are facing a world um, which will be more protectionist, uh, which will be more inward facing for many countries. Um, we will face a world where government will intervene much more in uh, the economy, in the private sector than it has in the past, including uh, taking equity, um, taking over um, certain companies. Um, we will face a world where inevitably, I think, the impact of this crisis is going to be very different in different places, uh, different in different sectors, different in different countries, different in different regions. Um, there are already signs uh, that it is, um, yes, while it is a negative impact across the board, but that it is hitting some um, places much, much harder than others, um, depending, for example, on the dependence on certain sectors. Um, one of the big challenges I think we are going to see with this is um, that uh, we will have in a number of different areas, excess supply, excess capacity, and that will be cross-border. So the question of how that is rebalanced um, is going to be extremely important. Um, is it going to be the case that in those countries where there are fiscal means to intervene, uh, they will be able to protect their country, uh, their companies, um, and other countries will suffer because of that? Um, I think this is one of the areas where we really have to be uh, extremely worried also at the European scale about the fragmented nature of that support. Um, if we are having state aid levels um, as they're running at the moment, at over 50% in one country, uh, that distorts the level playing field. Um, and I think this is something we haven't paid enough attention to. Clearly, uh, we want to enable countries to intervene, to help their, their companies, uh, but this has an implication for the European Union as a whole. Um, so I think the only efficient uh, answer to this is to have EU-level action, um, to uh, act as one on this. Um, but for the moment, uh, that has not happened. Yes, the recovery plan is important um, and I'm not going to have time to go into it, but it cannot be the only answer. And I think what we need is um, a renewed industrial strategy um, at the European level, which, yes, does retain uh, the objectives uh, which we have set beforehand, but which addresses this new environment we're in, the new challenges we have, um, and addresses this fragmentation. Uh, next slide, please. So when we're looking at what are the uh, actions we should be taking, um, I won't have time to go through all of this, um, but I think the question of state aid um, uh, is one of the most important ones we have to face. And there, um, I think we need to see uh, in how far we can actually have a common European approach to this. Um, what we have at the moment is not. Um, yes, we have uh, the uh, competition competencies of uh, the Commission, which can say yes or no. Um, but at the current state, it will be very difficult to say no um, to the member states. Um, when they want to intervene to help their, their companies. Um, I think what we need is a European strategy, one which uh, takes into account uh, that we will need the single market, that we will be more dependent on the single market than we, we have been before. Uh, but that single market has to function. It has to be a level playing field. Uh, I think we also need to be more ambitious uh, in many areas uh, with innovation, with research, um, with the kind of things we're using um, our funding for, um, is the recovery going to uh, 
uh, help retain employment, which is important, but will it also help um, to shift employment? Um, in many areas, uh, again, there will be excess supply, uh, so employment will have to transfer from certain sectors into other sectors. What are we doing to make sure that we have um, the instruments to do that? Now, I've already been asked to be very brief, so um, I will leave it at that. Um, but just to say, um, as, as a final conclusion, uh, I think we have a paradoxical situation, both at the global and at the European level. In many areas, we will have an instinct um, to go back to national level, to go back um, to my country first. Um, but on the other hand, I think what the crisis actually demonstrates um, is that cooperation is the only way we can really address this. And this is particularly true for the European Union. And we will have to prove over the next month, over the next years, that the European Union is up to that challenge. Fabian, thank you very much for also maybe providing a little bit the um, the, the wrap-up or the the look forward from uh, uh, some of the points that were raised. Um, and I'd like to turn now to um, the more open discussion. Uh, we don't have much time left, unfortunately, but um, I think the, the interventions, of course, were extremely rich and, and in their own right, uh, extremely worthwhile to, uh, uh, to spend some time on. What I'll try to do is to group uh, a number of the different questions that I have received via our questions uh, box here uh, together. Uh, and um, those that have asked, please forgive me if I don't uh, individually mention your, uh, your question or your name. Um, and you will recognize uh, some of the um, uh, some of the themes. So let me let me come back to this angle of the SMEs uh, that was mentioned a lot. Um, you know, I think in, in almost all the interventions as, a, as as an important focal point and one that also needs further attention. Uh, of course, the majority of employees, uh, the workforce in Europe, is employed by SMEs. Um, certainly, in our industries, um, many of the SMEs are active globally. So they may not be multinational companies in the sort of public sense, a publicly understood sense, but they are dependent on export markets across the world. What does resilience mean for them? Uh, maybe just to make this a little bit more practical, is that no foreign ownership? Is that um, local supply chains close to um, where, where production is? Is that diversified supply chains? What else uh, comes under this notion of resilience? I think that was a sort of a theme that came a lot through the questions. I'd like to ask that uh, maybe first and foremost uh, to, to Kerstin Jorna to give um, a perspective on this, but then certainly if others uh, want to comment, um, would, be, uh, would be very interested in your views. Uh, Kerstin, if I may, uh, give you the floor first. Uh, yes, I think there's no one size fits all. Uh, resilience may mean different things in different contexts. Uh, in uh, as far as pharmaceuticals and future vaccines are concerned, uh, it may mean that we need uh, the capacity in Europe to start up production very quickly and to learn from the experience that we had in reconverting production lines as well. Um, and that may be true for other uh, types of equipment as well. Uh, resilience may also mean that uh, we, we look at the ecosystem and we identify the, uh, the partners or the parts of the ecosystem that are essential for the whole ecosystem to function. That may be a technology, um, that may be a standard, um, that may be a company and the skills. It may also mean uh, the future development in terms of a startup, the startup and, and, and research community around this, uh, which we have to support. Um, and then the means to ensure that resilience may also differ. It may be grants, it may be uh, a kind of protection against, uh, you know, being bought up by, uh, by companies that enjoy very fat foreign subsidy packages. Um, so uh, we will we will really need to engage a discussion discussion on this. And uh, but for having a good policy, we need to have a good understanding of what happens. And that's where the uh, the, the the Googles that we put on for the ecosystems 
and uh, the data that we will generate, because at the moment we're mining data about these ecosystems, we are validating them with you, with all the stakeholders, that will be really important to have. And I do want to say that the forum uh, for the industry is not forgotten. We are about to set it up. Uh, we focused on you know, the activities to stabilize the economy in the first place. We will now have to build the government structures. Thank you, Kirsten, and and I could ask the other uh, panelists to put on their uh, their cameras as well, so we can see everyone. Uh, Mar I, I see uh, Martina, you raised your hand. Um, did you want to comment on this? Yes, I did, and uh, for me it was interesting, uh, especially this SMEs angle. Um, well, I, I have we could talk for hours again about the SMEs resilience, and we could mention uh, from access to finance, uh, to greening of SMEs, to digitalization of SMEs, uh, research and innovation, everything. We, we could do a lot of things. And we sure that we will, in the ITRE committee, in all these points in SMEs uh, strategy we are working on. So you will find it there for sure. But what I would like to mention as two main points, I see that they look uh, at the first sight as very general, but I think they are crucial in this moment. First one is simplification and no administrative burden. So I am a strong advocate for uh, the SMEs test in every legislation we are going to do. And uh, of course, I, I would welcome the principle one in, one out, but I would even more welcome principle one in, two out, because I think this is what we really should do for our businesses uh, from, the, from the European level. And so the simplification and no administrative burdens, this is my uh, first point. And the second one is even to support kind of entrepreneurial spirit in the sense of being aware that businesses are in the center of recovery in Europe right now. Uh, I can say it as a politician. We politicians very often mention businesses and SMEs and industry saying that this is the backbone of the EU economy, but we are not doing so much concrete things. So from saying it, we should go to the concrete measures and recognizing that SMEs will be in the center of the recovery. Okay, thank you, Martina. Uh, did I have anyone else? Uh, you can raise your hand. So I see you from our panelists who wanted to comment on this because I have one more question I will try to get in before we have to close. Rada, uh, if yes, you could uh, thank you on, on the SMEs. I would like to, uh, to make a short comment, um, agreeing with everything which was uh, said. And I want to uh, reinforce uh, the, uh, the idea on, uh, on a forced reshoring. Uh, because especially for the SMEs, which are the majority of our company in, uh, in, in uh, uh, the technology industry in Europe, um, they are working every day, they are competing by, by efficiency and by uh, innovation. So in their day-to-day -day work, the uh, optimization of the supply chain is something which, uh, which they, they, they have it anyhow. So uh, a forced reshoring would be for is it would never work for this, especially for the uh, for the SMEs uh, in uh, in our industry. Yes, Maria, you wanted to comment on this point, and we are running almost out of time, uh, and so I, I will ask one more question. But I, I understand, Maria, you wanted to comment. Okay, we don't seem to hear you. Um, if I may, uh, no, we don't hear you uh, right now. You seem to be, we seem to have lost your voice, Maria. Um, I have a, I have one question left, uh, which is around the ecosystems. And I've seen quite a few questions coming in on this um, with some, um, some hesitation or question marks around the approach. And I think, uh, Kerstin, you helped a lot to explain how you see this, um, but you know clearly there are still some uh, some some question marks there. Could you give the participants a little more of a flavor of what to expect on these ecosystems, kind of next steps, how that will link to the industrial forum or other types of um, of, of stakeholder dialogue? Um, you know, where do we go from here? Uh, that seems to be um, a question on several people's minds. Mm -hmm. Okay, on the ecosystems, uh, I can give you a picture. If you look at the European continent, you uh, uh, and nothing on the map except the big river systems. Uh, 
that's how the ecosystems function and that's what the ecosystems are the rivers they irrigate european the european continent with water the ecosystems irrigate european economy and they are composed of big and small uh, rivers and lakes so that's how they cooperate we identified the 14 and uh, and uh, uh, we described them that's a new methodology we will have to develop we will need more data and we will need to validate the data it's not a purpose in itself at all it's a way of looking at things and understanding reality better. Uh, because so far we've looked at the macro points and we are really pretty good at that. We have to develop the micro point as well. So we have, because it captures better the interlinkages and it also captures better, you know, the way startups and innovation actually contribute to our European strength. So only if we understand this well, we can build the good policies on that we will reach out we will test the methodology we're at the i would say at the end of the beginning maybe but not further we will have to develop it better but we believe that it will allow us to have the better policies and in the future it's not about europe and the single market doing their thing and the member states doing their thing it's about connecting all of this bringing it together and uh, in, for that, we need to understand better how things are linked. And in that respect, the ecosystems are a very good way for everybody to understand that it's not enough to do, you know, to be really good where I am, because in the way the economies are integrated, our SMEs cooperate with other SMEs in, in other parts of the market. We have to look at how they can work together and we have to, have to put more emphasis on it, emphasis on it and you know one example hydrogen uh, if europe wants to be the next standard setter on hydrogen we have to combine our forces we also have to look at the whole chain from production of hydrogen the use of hydrogen uh, the industrial applications the infrastructure we today have already 35 i believe hydrogen regions, hydrogen valleys they are called, uh, it shows it's a European phenomenon. And here we have the chance to actually make a difference. We've estimated that something like 400 billion euros needed for the next, uh, I mean, until 2030, to set up and to create a real market and to create market leadership. I like your point about technology leadership rather than technology uh, sovereignty or, or independence, what you asked. But, uh, this is is a perfect illustration how it could work and where we need to put everybody in the regions the member states the industries to make it a truly european endeavor and there's space to do it i mean we are ready we just have to roll it out now and uh, the ecosystems that that kind of look googles will help us to understand better and do the right policies okay um, thank you very much, Kerstin. And I'm afraid we, we have run out of time. We are over time already. So I'm, I'm not going to take any more interventions on this. I'm sorry to uh, the other panelists to cut you short if you meant to, to comment. Clearly, the ecosystems discussion um, will be a live one and, and a, a spirited one. Uh, like any new approach that's inviting um, scrutiny uh, and, and possibly uh, some things are question of clarification and possibly some yeah. things are also questions of principle. We will certainly be very engaged on the uh, Azorgalim also uh, with a view to better reflecting what we consider to be a key missing part of that, which is advanced manufacturing. Um, but now uh, it's left for me to close this with um, uh, apologies to our audience that uh, we of course could not exhaust the topic today. Um, uh, we do have good news, uh, which is uh, we will continue this conversation in our webinar series, uh, uh, Industrial Strategy in Focus, on the 10th of July, um, this time with the participation of the German presidency around very much the same uh, type of issues. So I hope to see many of you uh, on that occasion. Um, in the uh, immediate follow-up to our webinar, um, please um, fill in the survey just to give us some feedback and, of course, continue to uh, engage on, on social media. With that, uh, it remains for me to give a big thanks to all of our audience, to all of you for staying with us despite uh, running four or five minutes over, uh, and a particularly big thanks to all of our panelists, uh, to Maria Carvalho, uh, Martina Trabajova, Kerstin Jona, uh, Rada Rodriguez, and Fabian Sulik. Uh, I think that was a tremendously rich exchange. Uh, we look forward to, to continuing this conversation with you. Uh, a very good rest of the day uh, to all of you, and see you very soon. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. <clears throat>